Hello, uh, thank you for clicking on my talk. Uh, my name is Ben Zhang. I am a PhD student uh, in the Aero Astro Department at MIT. Uh, today I'll be talking about sampling via controlled stochastic dynamical systems. Uh, this is joint work with my advisor, Professor Yusuf Marzouk, who leads the uncertainty quantification group here, and Dr. Tudin Sahai, who is a technical fellow at the Raytheon Technologies Research Center. Um, so to begin, we'll look at this following Bayesian inference example. So at least in, so this is an example pulled from the subsurface modeling and geological engineering. So basically, in like kind of oil and gas exploration, you kind of want to figure out what is going on below the surface. Uh, but the problem is that you don't, you don't, you can only kind of take discrete number of observations on the surface. Um, so one approach to solving this problem um, is to pose this as a Bayesian inference question. Uh, so basically you have some sort of a prior on what is going on below the surface. You have some way of modeling the, the subsurface, subsurface features. Um, and you incorporate observations taken on the surface, so you can construct some sort of a likelihood model, uh, to, get a better to get a better idea as to what is going on below the surface through this posterior distribution. Okay. Um, and at least in the physical sciences, typically the expensive part is in the likelihood is that it typically involves some sort of a complex physical model. So in this case, uh, most likely some sort of a, a partial differential equation. But more broadly in machine learning, uh, even if the likelihood is maybe simple to evaluate, uh, with so much data that's out there or may, that may be evolved in your machine learning problem, uh, the likelihood may end up being very complex and expensive anyways. And typically you want to kind of compute expectations or basically integrals that involve this posterior distribution. And that's not very feasible, especially if it's very high dimensional. So typically you resort to some sort of Monte Carlo method. But when there's no normalization constant, uh, you, can, you, know, you can't really resort to any sort of typical sampling methods. Um, so our idea is to kind of consider basically how can we use kind of a controlled diffusion process uh, to sample distributions uh, that are given to us. Okay. So basically, here's the big idea of this talk. Um, we want to figure out if there's a way to kind of use a diffusion process uh, to sample from a given prob a normalized probability distribution. So the problem is, given some sort of unnormalized pi hat, which is a probability distribution on RD, you want to compute samples from it, or more like its normalized version pi uh, to compute expectations with respect to it. And the idea is to construct some sort of an SDE, ideally so that uh, for some finite time t, that's less than infinity, um, the basically if you independently sampled uh, trajectories of this SDE, uh, where those points, those trajectories end up at time t will basically be distributed according to your target density. So this is the ideal ideal situation, because if you were truly able to do this, then basically this generates independent samples that can be used for okay. Well, if you can truly get the exact samples from exactly from pi, you get exact inference. But even if you got some sort of approximation, that's pretty good. You can do use it for approximate inference. Uh, you can use it for important sampling, or you can use it for like as a proposal in Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, now, this sort of a notion is not exactly new. So people have looked at using dynamical systems or stochastic dynamical systems uh, to for sampling. Uh, so one really well-known example is, of course, is the Langevin dynamic. So given a target pi hat, uh, it is well known that if you just basically take the log, the gradient of the log of uh, the density, uh, and you kind of use that in the drift part of an SDE, and then you give it some like, basically random kicks, this brand Brownian motion here, then it is known, well known that as kind of time goes to infinity, uh, that basically x at infinity will be distributed according to pi exactly. So basically the pi becomes the equilibrium distribution or the station distribution um, of, the, of, these, of the dynamics. Um, another very famous example is Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and its variants, for example, nuts, or it uses Hamiltonian dynamics to for proposals in MCMC. Uh, there are examples of neural SDEs, where basically you can kind of use a neural net to model the drift portion, and but typically so far it's only been usually been done for generative modeling. 
and this sort of a problem is kind of related to a, a, rel a, a very a, rel a relatively older problem for, um, called the Schrodinger bridge problem, uh, which was first conceived by Schrodinger, you know, in, in the nineteen thirties. Uh, basically, given some sort of a reference process, an initial marginal and a terminal marginal, uh, you want to find some sort of a, a modification to the original the reference process that somehow bridges the initial and terminal marginals. Uh, so that, you know, for example, uh, in, in, in some recent work uh, here, uh, you you will see that they have tried to kind of um, use some sort of an STE uh, to sample from a, a target distribution that takes advantage of this kind of shoulder and bridge problem. Okay. Um, so we'll go through some background as to, like, some necessary background behind uh, our approach. So in our case, we're looking at specifically a controlled SDE, not just like any old SDE. So basically we're kind of like given a, some sort of like a reference SDE. Uh, how do you modify it so that you can kind of sample from the, so your target distribution? Okay. All right. Uh, so here's some background. So for our case, we're going to consider so like, like XT be a time homogeneous. So basically the drift and diffusion terms do not depend on time. Um, diffusion process in RD, and we'll call this the reference process. So basically this is untouched. This is, uh, you know, just, no, not, not, no, not, we have not done anything to it yet, okay? Uh, where A of XT is the drift term, B of XT is the diffusion term. Um, and you have some sort of an, a, a deterministic initial condition here. And basically, uh, for some fi uh, fixed time capital T, not not infinity, uh, basically the system naturally will basically if you start at a, a single point, a deterministic initial point, uh, after some time it will spread out, it will diffuse into some distribution eta t at capital time cap at time capital t, and we'll call this distribution the reference distribution. We'll call this eta t. Okay. Um, and we'll give you some tools that are typically used in stochastic differential equations. So, namely, uh, these two equations, about the, the equations called the Kolmogorov equations, will be very important uh, in our work later. Um, so, you may have heard of the the Ford Kolmogorov equation, or or more often the Fokker-Planck equation, which basically describes how the system's uh, marginal density evolves over time. So, in our in this case, if you had an initial condition. Uh, at uh, at x, um, how does the or sorry the, if you had an initial condition at x prime, how does the density evolve over time? Okay, uh, but the more important thing we will we'll be looking at is the Kolmogorov backward equation, which actually describes the evolution of the statistics. So basically, if you had in this case if you had some sort of terminal condition f of x, how does the expectation evolve over time? Um, and in both equations, it's dependent on this operator called the infinitesimal generator. Uh, and it's a, it's a common tool that's used in uh, SD, in stochastic analysis. Um, okay. um, so the idea for us is to basically find some sort of a controlled diffusion process, yt, uh, which, which is basically, it has the same drift as the system before and the same diffusion term as before and the same initial condition, uh, can you somehow find a controller, like some sort of a modified drift term, in effect, such that the marginal of yt at capital T, uh, it will be distributed according to your target distribution. And the thing that will allow us to do this is basically there is a theorem or there's a particular thing called the Duke transform that says kind of like the optimal controller that achieves this goal is linked to this a solution of the Kolmogorov backward equations over here. So this will be very important for us. Okay. And basically uh, with this, we'll be able to kind of write down what is the exact kind of quote unquote exact way or controller that will achieve this goal. Okay. Uh, so we'll describe the dupe transform. So of course this is by dupe and it's also well uh, kind of looked into by the stochastic optimal control community. Um, so basically let's just say you have a Markov transition kernel uh, P of T T prime X and X prime which basically just means that the probability 
that the state at some future time at t prime will end up in some region A, uh, given that it is currently at time t at position x, is just equal to kind of you integrate over the region A, where you just and you just kind of integrate this this function with uh, uh, t x uh, and t prime held fixed. Okay, and the do transfer kind of tells you the following. So let's just be very careful and just kind of go to walk through this the statement of the theorem. So let's just say you have some for a function f, if I continue to differentiable, that is strictly positive over your, uh, your, your whole domain. And you basically define this phi here to be kind of the solution of the Kolmogorov graw back equations with f of x over here uh, being the terminal condition. Okay? Um, and basically, if you were to choose a controller that is dependent on the solution of the Kolmogorov graw back equation over here, so look at this, the, the connection between these two, um, and the controller is going to be kind of you take the diffusion term, uh, the adjoint of the diffusion term, or the, the transpose of the diffusion term, multiply with the gradient of the law of the solution to the Kolmogorov graw back equation, then kind of the transition kernel of your controlled SDE can actually be written down in closed form. So it, assuming that you have uh, these, this, you know, the solution in closed form and the Markov transition kernel in closed form. Uh, and basically it looks like this. So the Markov transition kernel looks as follows. And this may not be super enlightening, but in particular, you kind of want to pay attention to this, this kind of the special case. Or the case where basically if you, let's say T is, is zero, T prime is capital T, this the, you know, the end point, right? And then you have some initial point, initial condition x naught. So basically, this means that we're just starting from a single point. Uh, it, it, you typically, it will evolve into this eta t here. But with this controller, what does it evolve into? So basically, if you were given this controller, it will t and you kind of simulated your controlled SDE. Uh, then the distribution that this, the the samples of the controlled SDE kind of ends up in uh, will look like this. Okay. So it would be basically be uh, f of x, whatever your f of x is, multiplied by uh, the kind of the reference distribution like of the untouched SDE, uh, divided by phi here. Okay. Uh, so this is pretty interesting because this is kind of saying this is what the new density looks like if you apply this control. So basically, okay, how can you use the do transform for sampling now? Okay. Uh, so just come back here. So Basically, what if you chose your f of x to be a very, you know, a clever choice? For example, what if you chose uh, f of x uh, to be the ratio between oops, uh, pi hat of x and eta t of x? Because if you were truly able to do that, then what you what you see here, if you took this and plugged it in over here, uh, then the um, marginal of yt at capital T will be distributed according to eta t multiplied by pi hat of x over eta t uh, divided by phi at zero and x naught, which is exactly basically pi hat of x over phi zero x naught. Okay, and what this suggests is basically uh, if you apply this controller, then yt will be distributed according to uh, pi, which is what you wanted. And you get the normalization constant out of it if you truly had solved uh, the Kolmogorov graw backward equation. So this seems all very nice. Uh, but the problem is, of course, the catch is it requires solving the Kolmogorov graw backward equation, which is probably hard, no, which is really hard to do uh, beyond a few, you know, like say, two dimensions, really. Okay. Um, so it's not really a tractable way of kind of sampling if you were to kind of consider solving the KBE directly. Um, another common way of looking at it is kind of posing this in terms of a con stochastic control formulation. Uh, but likewise, this is also very intractable because it basically involves solving a very high dimensional optimal control problem. And it's not really like a single one. It turns out if you wanted to really do it, it's a uh, it's like a fan, you have to solve a family of optimal control problems over the entire domain, and they're just very intractable to do in high dimensions. Okay. So our, our kind of approach is to figure out a way to make controlled SDEs more tractable. Okay. 
how we'll do is basically just kind of think of it like this. Um, our goal is to just find, uh, just to, is, is to sample, a sample from sort of a given target distribution. So we have a lot of control in this formulation. So for example, we're not fixed. We're not, we're not, we we're not given uh, to a particular SD. We're allowed to kind of choose whatever SD we want. And we can choose an SD such that the Kolmogorov backward equation is simple to sample from, sorry, simple to solve. And uh, such that the, and you can choose an ST such that the reference marginal eta t is also simple to find. In particular, we're going to choose uh, basically the simplest one other than Brownian motion, which is a linear ST. Okay. Uh, so basically, a of x just becomes a times x, and b of x just becomes a, a fixed matrix b. Okay. And the only thing you have to assume here is that A and B are full rank and diagonalizable. Okay. So in particular, you can even make it simpler. Um, you can just say A is the negative identity. And B will define, and we'll, we'll discuss how B uh, comes in later. And uh, the remarkable thing is, if you do this, uh, then you can actually solve the Kolmogorov backward equations. You can actually get solutions to the Kolmogorov backward equations relatively easily. Uh, so Recall that uh, you have this in the PD, the operator, this infinitesimal generator looks like this. It turns out this infinitesimal generator is always linear, no matter even if the system is nonlinear. In the case of these linear STEs, uh, the eigenfunctions can be found pretty easily. So you can just write them down. They are the tensorized Hermite polynomials. Uh, Vn, uh, where n is a multi index. Uh, is just a multiplication of kind of the Hermit polynomials. Uh, the order of the Hermit polynomials depend, depends on the the index, uh, the ith index, um, and they are dependent on basically the eigenvectors and eigen eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the transpose. Okay. And the eigenvalue of a uh, corresponding to, like, say, eigenvalue eigenfunction t. Uh, can also be written down relatively easily. So you can actually then, with these eigenfunctions, um, solve the Kolmogorov backward equation or get a solution to the Kolmogorov backward equation uh, really easily. And if you could truly actually uh, kind of expand this function f, this ratio, density ratio, in terms of the eigenfunctions, you can kind of get a solution, like just for free almost, actually basically for free. Okay. So just to recap, so the idea we're trying to make is make sampling with controlled STEs tractable. So again, so this is sort of a system. We want to construct a sort of a, a controlled ST that looks like this. Uh, dyt is equal to negative yt plus b times this controller u dt plus b dwt with some initial condition x0. Um, you have some sort of a given reference density, which we'll talk about how do you choose later, um, and a target density pi hat. Um, the optimal control is the dupe transform, which looks like this, uh, where phi depends on the solution to this Kolmogorov backward equation. Um, and if you were to truly able to kind of expand this density ratio here uh, in terms of the, um, the eigenfunctions here, then by the property of, the, by the fact that, by the virtue of that, this is a linear PDE, uh, you can get a solution to the PD very easily just kind of take the coefficients and multiply it by this exponential factor over here, depending on what the eigenvalues are. Okay, so just to kind of illustrate what's going on, we'll go through, we'll walk through a really simple example just to kind of show you what the, the concepts are running around here. Uh, so let's just say you had some sort of a target distribution pi tar, which is going to be x squared multiplied by some sort of Gaussian uh, that's kind of moved away from it. Okay. Um, or moved away from the origin. Uh, the reference dynamical system we're going to look at is just basically a you know, standard linear STE. This is called, an, or you may have heard of it as an OU process, an ornstein uhlenbeck process. Um, and the idea is, well, uh, let's just, well, we, we, we will choose, in this case, we can choose T um, and X naught uh, such that uh, the a to t will be basically the Gaussian part of the target distribution. Okay, so this is a cleverly, so we can choose, we can choose t, we can choose x naught 
so that we can get a kind of a, a reference STE such that it will make our lives easier later. So basically, if you chose eta t to be this, then if you looked at the ratio f of x is equal to pi over eta t, and because you cho we chose eta t in a clever fashion, f of x is just very simply x squared. Okay? And for this uh, SDE, uh, the eigenfunctions are uh, Hermit polynomials. Um, so they're going to be x squared minus 1 and uh, 1. Okay, so basically you can expand x squared in terms of x squared minus 1 and 1. Okay. Um, and after you get these uh, eigenfunctions, uh, the solution to the Kolmogorov backward equation uh, is as follows. So you have uh, phi of t and x uh, is equal to x squared minus 1 e to the minus 2t minus t plus 1. Um, and the corresponding dupe transform, uh, which is basically which is written down over here. And if you were to simulate it, for, uh, sorry, if you were to kind of, and you plugged it in into this SDE and you simulated this SDE, uh, these are the samples you get. The, the histogram is in orange. And you can see that it matches up pretty well with density. So this is basically enables exact sampling of this target distribution through this SDE. Okay. Um, so this is this is also this is only for a very simple example. So you might ask, like, okay, how does it work for a more complicated example? Um, so that's uh, what we'll discuss for the rest of the time. Um, so just to recap, the problem is again, dupe transform is very difficult to find. Basically, it requires solving a very high dimensional PDE or a family of optimal control problems. Our approach is to choose an SDE. Uh, choose a reference SD to be linear so that the PD solution can be written down in terms of these eigenfunctions. Um, but then actually it leads to some questions, basically how do you project this ratio onto the eigenfunctions? It was very convenient if you can just kind of write it down as we did in this very simple example, but in, in general, that's very hard to do. And there are a lot of kind of design choices that we have to make. So for example, how do you choose this eta t? How do you choose this t? And this t actually determines what the eigenfunctions look like. Uh, which are all open questions. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss them briefly over here, but these, this is uh, very much ongoing research. The most the basic idea, or the main takeaway we want to take away, uh, from this talk, is that we've replaced kind of like this approach, the typical approach to the, the dupe transform, which is kind of you can only really look at this high dimensional PDE, or you look at these optimal control problems. And we kind of, we'll, we, you know, the main point we want to show off is that we have converted the problem into just the problem of function approximation. Um, so let's address the first problem. The idea is uh, we have this function f of x is equal to pi hat over eta t. And we are given um, some a finite set of eigenfunctions. And the idea is how do you find an approximation f tilde uh, in terms of uh, these eigenfunctions? Uh, that, okay, so, so that you can kind of expand f in terms of the eigenfunctions approximately, such that it's a good approximation to f of x. And actually, the nice thing about all this is, if you kind of go back to the dupe transform, um, if you were given this f tilde, which is an approximation to f, and you were to kind of sample or use it in the dupe transform for sampling, um, it will actually tell you what the approximate density you're sampling from. And then it will tell you, like, this approximate density we'll call it pi tilde, looks like this is just f tilde multiplied by eta t divided by gamma tilde. And gamma tilde is just kind of like the evaluation of the Kolmogorov backward equation solution uh, given this f tilde. Um, so OK, again, so now we'll come back. So how do you find these these coefficients over here, C naught, Cn's? Um, so one immediate thing you might think of is L2 projection uh, with respect to kind of the invariant density of the SD. Um, and in from function approximation terms, um, that is the optimal thing to do in L2. But the problem is that uh, for our purposes, because we want to guarantee that the approximate f tilde is always positive, because that's how you can, that, that's how this equation makes sense, right? Because otherwise, uh, this is not a proper density anymore. Um, so it's not a good idea to do L2 projection because there's no guarantee of positivity. And since we're working with densities, uh, one approach is to kind of just consider kind of distances or divergences that are usually uh, used to kind of measure kind of measure discrepancies between densities. 
Um, so in our case, we're going to kind of consider two. One is the Kobeck Liber divergence, and the other is going to be called the Fisher divergence. Um, and we'll kind of briefly discuss um, how they work, how they ended up working in some numerical examples later. Okay. So because of the fact that with this approximate density, uh, you have you have access to the approximate density, uh, given approximate f tilde, uh, it allows you to kind of use these um, divergences. And we'll use these divergences to kind of figure out this coefficient c in here. Um, so if you kind of just went through the math, uh, the nice thing is, uh, and, and, and kind of took advantage of the fact that this pike tilde um, can be written in terms of eta t. And eta t is something you can get always because since we're looking at linear SDEs, um, eta t's are usually always Gaussians. Um, you obtain kind of these optimization problems uh, to find c. Uh, so it, on on the on the left here. So if you if you kind of went through the math of the KL divergence, you'll get this sort of optimization problem. If you use the Fisher divergence, you'll get that sort of optimization problem. Um, we don't really have a good grasp as to kind of the properties of these optimization problems, but we, this is what we use to kind of find these coefficients. Um, and because of the fact that you can kind of re rewrote these expectations with respect, you know, instead of writing these expectations with respect to pi hat. Uh, we wrote them with respect to this eta t. Uh, these are actually, you know, possible. You can actually compute these. Um, the other question you might ask is, well, um, what eigenfunctions we use? Um, so for lower dimensional problems, uh, which kind of corresponds with like what is the index that you use here? Um, so for lower dimensional problems, um, you can consider kind of the total order basis, which basically means that the you choose indices such that like the L1 norm is less than or equal to some some, some total order R. Uh, but this is not very tractable in higher dimensions. So in higher dimensions, one thing we consider is the hyperglottic cross truncation, uh, which you use some sort of a um, some sort of a pseudo norm instead to kind of uh, kind of eliminate a lot of kind of higher order cross terms and only consider higher order terms um, in only certain, certain directions. Okay. Um, okay, so that kind of covers how we will project onto the eigenfunctions. Um, but then there's, the next question is then how do you choose some sort of an MB or some sort of reference distribution eta t and its initial condition. So for our case, we're always going to assume that the initial condition is deterministic. Uh, mostly because uh, the formulation becomes a bit more difficult to work with if it's not deterministic. So basically, our initial condition always starts with the point. Okay. Um, the second thing is, well, the objective function uh, up here, over here, uh, requires evaluations. Uh, require, you know, if you want to evaluate these, these objective functions, it requires samples from eta t. Uh, but if Eta t, but this basically kind of you kind of treat eta t as an important sampling distribution to your target. So if you don't, so you as a rule of thumb, you can you should try to kind of choose eta t such that it's a good important sampling distribution. So 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 some some things we've tried is for example the Laplace approximation. So this would allow you to get as to like the scale of the target distribution, like the what what the covariance matrix would look like. And it'll kind of tell you where is uh, the distribution. So you can always shift the distribution back to the origin. So for our case, we're always going to consider cases where x naught, the initial condition, is just zero at the origin. Okay. Um, and then after you get some sort of approximation to uh, some sort of Gaussian approximation to your distribution, uh, let's just say your eta t you determined was a normal distribution with covariance matrix sigma. And the idea then you might ask like how do you find your uh, B term in your SD? So remember our SD that we work with looks like this. Uh, so the question is how do you choose this B here? Well, if you were given a A to T and some capital time T, uh, you can figure out B uh, according to the eigenvalue decomposition of sigma and then choosing B accordingly. Okay. So to summarize, uh, here's the algorithm to kind of just bring back together everything we talked about. So the idea is you have some sort of unnormalized target density pi and some set of multi-indices i, script i. 
And the idea is you want to find the dupe transform, which is the optimal control uh, UTX. So basically, the idea first is to find a, uh, a an approximation a to t to pi hat, and define f of x to be this density ratio. Um, and then find the eigenvalue decomposition of of your of the sigma, and then set uh, b accordingly. Uh, which allows you to kind of construct the eigenfunctions over here. So the eigenfunctions are dependent on the B. And you draw samples from your reference distribution and you solve one of the uh, one of the objective functions that we discussed before. So in this case, it's to minimize the KL. You kind of have to solve this optimization problem instead. Okay. And after you find the C star, uh, you the dupe transform is as follows. So then the question is like, well, what do you do with your controller after you compute it? Um, so some virtues of this method is that after you find the controller, uh, you can actually generate points from this approximate density pi tilt uh, in parallel. Uh, so unlike kind of MCMC, which you know, fundamentally is sequential, um, you can or uh, you can obtain these. These this is basically embarrassingly parallel. So in some sense. It's great, right? Um, after you get the samples, you can also use it. You can, one way to use it is to use it in uh, approximate inference. So maybe you're, pi, you're satisfied with how uh, your approximation of pi tilde to pi, so that you can kind of just estimate expectations with respect to pi and just kind of pretend that it's, good, it's a good enough distribution to pi and just, and uh, pi tilde is a good enough distribution to pi and just kind of use it directly. Um, another approach is to use it in self-normalized importance sampling. So, uh, you know, you can, basically, it comes down to using pi tilde as an important sampling distribution to pi. But of course, we don't have the normalization constant to pi. Um, so, one way is so in self-normalized importance sampling is you have to also kind of uh, estimate the normalization constant while you do the important sampling. So, this is how you would estimate the normalization constant. Uh, another thing that we, we won't discuss in detail, but you we do have, to, but then one ha does have to address is the discretization error when you when you consider an SD. So um, in important sam, so if you're doing this in approximate inference, it's not as big of a worry. But in important sampling, you do have to uh, correct it, and one way is to kind of consider the Scarsano formula that comes from stochastic calculus. Alright, so we'll run through just a few simple examples. Uh, so here's our first case where we have a 1D bimodal distribution. So this is not just a, what the, the really simple case where it's just like a, some sort of a x squared multiply a Gaussian. This is truly just two Gaussians. Um, and the idea is we want to, okay, so in this example, we chose our ambient or the reference distribution to be eta 1 here. And we use 10,000 points to kind of resolve the, so you can see that and or as you kind of increase the order of your polynomial. So in this case, this is a zeroth order, which is a constant polynomial. And uh, as you introduce more and more polynomials into uh, your F tilde, you see that uh, the approximate, which is in red, uh, approaches the exact more and more. Uh, but even if you are not, even if they're not exact, the samples that are produced uh, by these approximations are still pretty good, or at least by, by the eyeball norm. Um, so, but one thing about, so you can see that for sure, as you increase the order of the of a polynomial you, you consider, um, you get a better approximation, um, but uh, it's not, you, there's a bit of a trade-off. So if you want to, if one wants to use higher order polynomials, uh, then it typically requires more points because they're a bit more unruly to deal with. So in this example, we can plot the KL divergence between the ref, uh, between the target and the approximate pi tilde, um, and basically, and we just kind of graph it um, you know, as total order increases, uh, and we ran this many times because, of course, we had to, you know, the the uh, uh, optimization problem involves an expectation. So if you do a multi over multiple uh, over multiple batches, you can get multiple different answers. And so basically, what we see is for lower order, so like order between zero and four. Uh, on the left, if you use 2,500 samples, there's not much uh, difference in the KL divergence. But if you increase the order, if you go to five and above, you can see that there's these like large uncertainty bands. So basically, 
uh, which kind of suggests that having more polynomials uh, may not necessarily be good, especially if you don't have enough points to kind of capture your, um, your, your, your density. And this is a 1D example, and 2,500 points for 1D example is quite a lot. But you can see that if you use more samples, you can kind of reduce these error bars here. All right. Um, so the next example we'll look at is a, a kind of a modified example from a normalizing flows paper. Uh, so in this case, we chose, uh, again, t to be 1, and this uh, kind of this reference density to, according to this. Um, and you see, again, on the top four figures, um, as you increase the, t in this case, we use the total order basis. As you increase the total order basis, it approaches the target more and more. And in red, you can see kind of where, the, where these points ended up. Um, but what is, and so on the top we use, just use the KL objective with 10,000 samples, but on the bottom we kind of compare it with the Fisher divergence. And because the Fisher divergence uses this gradient information uh, that's it's not used in the KL divergence, you can actually get uh, a kind of more, it's a more stable divergence to work with in some sense, uh, where with just 200 evaluations of the target or the target gradient of the target, uh, the Fisher uh, divergence can more or less capture you know, most features of uh, the uh, kind of the target, whereas in, in, if you use KL, um, it, it's, it just gives you kind of junk. Okay. Um, and the last example we'll look at is this Bayesian logistic regression. So we have just applied our method onto some data sets that were mentioned in Gershman uh, and demonstrating their feasibility in higher dimensions. Um, and we compare it with the no U-turn sampler with the basically given this the same computational budget, the, the same number of density evaluations. Uh, in our case, the reference distributions were found via Laplace approximations, and this is kind of the result. So in this case, we kind of plot, or we, we kind of just uh, were showing the testing error between uh, the controlled SDE and nuts, and just kind of show that they more or less match up. Uh, D is kind of the dimension of the posterior that we were considering. Um, so this is very much ongoing work. So some issues in this work is basically, so one example, one thing is uh, I haven't really described as to how to choose a reference distribution robustly. Um, that's, uh, I'll show you examples uh, as to like how sensitive the method is to kind of the choice of the reference distribution. Another problem is uh, evaluating the objective function. So sometimes the reference distribution may not be a good, maybe a, ref a good reference distribution that's uh, for SDE purposes may not be a good one for evaluation of the objective function. So you may, we, we also want to look at how do you evaluate the objective functions more robustly. Uh, another thing we haven't really discussed is how do you set this T? Uh, and T is intimately linked to what the eigenfunctions look like because it affects what B looks like. Uh, and we haven't fully investigated as to how that impacts the, the method. Um, no, and uh, there are definitely ways of kind of taking advantage of the structure of the target that we haven't looked into. So basically, how do you make this method more scalable? So, uh, you know, the example I only showed up to, the, 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 uh, in, in this case, is only up to 14 dimensions, but how do you really make this uh, scalable and kind of competitive compared to other methods that still yet to be uh, looked into? Okay. And more broadly, you just kind of want to make this approach a bit more robust. Okay. Um, also, currently, we're only able to handle targets with gouging tails. It can be expanded beyond that, but the formulation behind that is a bit more complicated, a bit more involved. So one of the issues that you can kind of look at is basically this impact of the reference distribution. So here's the example, the 2D example again. Um, so on top, uh, it just shows you the kind of the, um, an example with the reference distribution being uh, as before. And you see that if you use Fisher or KL, they more or less capture the two lobes pretty well. But if you just kind of modify the ambient a little, not, not, not by too much, but just not enough, um, what happens is that you get a dramatically different result. So at least in four Fisher, it still identifies two lobes despite not cap kind of capturing these the shapes correctly. But in the case of the four KL, it just kind of completely you know, didn't move. It didn't move at all. Um, so you can see like this is relatively not very robust at least as it stands now. 
um, this, this method is not super robust and it's like kind of a, a modification to the uh, ambient or the reference distribution can really affect how well the method works. So to conclude, uh, we considered sampling with controlled diffusion processes by using the, by considering the tube transform. And basically the idea is that with a suitably chosen reference process, so a linear process in our case, and some sort of a reference distribution, you can kind of convert or reduce this really high dimensional PD problem or optimal control problem into just a projection or high dimensional approximation problem. Uh, we apply them to some simple non-gouging distributions and some simple patient inference problems um, to make a point that we there are many aspects that we have not explored yet uh, that will hopefully make the approach more scalable and robust. Um, so thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me at uh, bjz at mit.edu. Okay, well, thank you very much. Hope you enjoy any other talks you may listen to.